little bit with you. Right? I have to mix it. Oh, yeah, I've got, I've got yeah. This is. Oh, fuck, I can't open it here. Yeah. I don't have to cut it. So, yeah, this is this wax based cinema makeup, which. Uh -huh. You have to wash it off since it, it might clog your pores. Yeah, okay. That's like if, right. you, if you have a beauty routine of uh, washing your face, it, uh -huh. would be, make, it would be good. Not only with, with the lotion. Do you have actually beauty routines? No. Nah. <laughs> I'm out other than taking a shower. <laughs> then why do you look so good? Well, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we were looking at your naked butt yesterday in Pittsburgh and the Warhol uh, Museum yeah, yeah. And, uh, in, in sleep. But <laughs> how do you feel when you look yourself so young and fresh and it's naked like, it's and sexy? It's like some, somebody else. I don't think it's, when I look at myself, I don't see it sexy or, or look not. Up. How it all started, how did you end up uh, as part of uh, uh, Warhol circles, as I understood you were boyfriend, you were dating Andy Warhol? Uh, how did it all start? Up. You go up. Were you born here in New York? Yes, I was. I was born here in New York and went to school here mm -hmm. at Columbia University. So how it started in, in, in here, in, like in this building and around this, this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. you, you have been in living the, here all in the time. Huh? You have been living here all well, time. Well, yeah, I've been in this building since the early 60s. It was a very small scene of, you know, f filmmakers, poets, um, mm -hmm. uh, painters and sculptors. And, and, you know, it was just about 80 people. And, and, and Andy happened to be one of them. The pop, you know, there was just seven pop artists with, and, and this art scene. Mm -hmm. So I knew a lot of artists at the time, and I, I met Andy at a party in 1962, but it was a very s a small scene, and we all knew each other. One of the things was at Judson Church in Washington Square, something called the Judson Dance Theater. Where all, all these things were happening. The happenings were happening. Alan Capra was happening. Carol E. Schneeman was doing Meet Joy, the beginnings of happenings. And Andy went to all those things, as, as I did, and, and this was this extended scene. Was it love at the first sight? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> no, but so, so I met Andy uh, uh, before his opening at, at Sydney Jenison at his opening uh, three days later in, on November 3rd, 1962. You remember the exact date still? <laughs> well, because it's three days after Halloween. Because when, I mean, for, for instance, it was a very tiny scene, and these seven pop artists was shown in, in the Sydney Janus Gallery on October 31st, which, which in our culture is Halloween, Halloween. Mm -hmm. And it was just a pop art. You can imagine a Jim Rosenquist or a Leroy Lichtenstein or whatever. And it was so con considered so outrageous that, that it was all, all of the abstract painters who were in Sydney Janus, like Rothko, de Kooning, Jackson Pollock, all resigned the gallery at this trash that was being shown. So I remember this because I was there. And three days later, so it's November 3rd now, that was Andy's first show. So first show ever. First show ever, uh, and which had the Gold Marilyn and, and the Campbell Soups and all, all of those things at the Eleanor Ward Gallery. And he asked you out? No, but then we saw each other all the time. I mean, because we, they were, like, for instance, the, the very... No, no, I no. Actually, we just met then. I didn't really get to know. We were we had dinner on the top floor of this building. A friend of mine had a loft. This is the, we're on the in the bunker of William Burroughs. This loft and this. and on the top floor there was a loft where where Andy and I got invited to dinner before we went to the Judson Dance Theater. But this was sort of in now in in February or, or March, and it's from then that we started seeing each other because the very next night was the world premiere of Flaming Creatures, Jack Smith's Fl Flaming Creatures. But each of us, Andy and me, had seen it at least 24 times before, over the year and a half before, because Jack just kept showing it. So you would see it and see it and see it. So there was this world premiere, and neither of us wanted it to go, but it's the world premiere, so we had to go. So I had, we rendezvoused the next night after this dinner, and from then on we sort of went to things all the time together. Even Wikipedia says that you split up in 1964. Yeah. The end of, by the end of by the end because in 1960 the end of 1964, I meet William Burroughs and Brian Geisen. They come to New York and they're saying, and I, I switch worlds. They arrived sort of in November, 
of 64. And from January on, I was in their world. You know, it was a complete, it seemed strange, but William Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg, all that world was, uh, it could have been China. It was just another world away. And so I was in a di different world for decades then. And you became a poet, uh, or you no, I, 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 I've always been a poet since I, you know, quite young. But uh, how did you end up as a star of the sleep? Well, Andy didn't know what he was doing. That's how I went. That's how I ended up. What happened? What happened? So, so in after his show in '62, all of '63, Jonas Mikas invented something called the, the Filmmakers Co-op over there, the Cinematech in, the, in that building, which you know over there. And and he had an unusual. It's a very early years, '63 particularly, because there were lots of small movie houses in New York City leftover from the 20s and 30s, but small where there's only 100 seats or 110 seats. And, and uh, this, they were still functioning as movie theaters all over the city, but they, sometimes they had to be closed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because <laughs> there's not enough people to, to keep it going. You know, what, and so they were open on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So Jonas got this great idea of renting, the, there was about 10 of them all over, from downtown to uptown, renting these cinemas by the night. You know, like Tuesday night, we're showing these four films, and you know, Jack Smith's, you know, and Kenneth Anger, this and that. And, uh, and sometimes two or three nights a week in different theaters, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but in different theaters or somehow whatever, John, and he, he got them very cheap, I think, so it was like a free venue. And, and, so the, and then there was this world of us that so we all went as much as we could. So at this point, Andy and I went I'm a, almost two or three times a week. And, and what happened was, he, he was no more a filmmaker than I was, you know, but he's an artist, right? So, you know, so he was just fascinated at the process, you know? And when you see things over and over, like they would always play things, to every new one they'd put forth. There were four films a day, a night, so they'd always put the new one forth. And you had to listen to the first and the second and the third. But the first was Jack Smith's Flaming Kitchen, which you've already seen 20 times. And Kenneth Angus' Scorpio Rising, we've also seen 15 times. And, and, and whatever, Connors or anybody else. Or, uh, so, but we, we, and when you see things over and over, you understand what's good and what's bad. So that's how Andy learned to make a film. Sitting, you know, the endless changing reels, 16 millimeter changing reels. I could see him. He was... He would say, well, why, don't, why didn't they do it that way? Or you could see him seeing a mistake or how it should be done. And, and, a, and a few months later, three or four months later, he got the idea, why don't I do this? <laughs> Make a movie. And, or, so, so that's how he started. Why do you think this movie is so special? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> do you like it yourself? Uh, but yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a complicated, it was his first movie. And he didn't know how to do it, and and so that's why. And it was torture for him for a year, and and, and almost a disaster. And it's really curious how he was able to tra transform it into into a into a film. Do you remember something about um, filming the movie? How did you really fell asleep? Did you have to take sleeping pills, or uh, how how was it? Well, I, I then and now like to sleep, so I slept all the time. I, really, I was a bit. I drank a lot in those days. So you know, when you drink a lot, you can always go to, and you're asleep a little. You drank. You always either have a hangover or you're drunk, so you can always go. go to, so I was often sleeping when he called. I mean, so, and it was he was it was he it was just part of an every he was looking at whatever so an everyday activity, and he sort of film Bob and Diana. He, Eating a mushroom and that, that, that's magic could, mushroom. No, no, just an ordinary, just a dumb idea. Of Bob and Deanna eating a mushroom, for, but that only takes five minutes or something. And that, he was looking for a bigger thing. That, the, so that's, that's how he sleepy. came up on the idea of sleep. What was the feedback for this movie huh? when it was ready? What was the feedback? Did people love this movie? Uh, well, uh, well it, it was so notorious before it came out because be, because Andy was just beginning to get famous, but he knew a lot about how to get publicity. Or so he had so many friends, they endlessly, he endlessly got publicity. And so with the, when he got the idea of doing it, which is, is sort of, even before he filmed it, he shot it in the summer of 63. But instantly, it was famous. This, you know, eight hour movie, he hadn't shot it. You know, but he was getting in, getting in those fashion magazines and magazines, Andy Wall's eight hour movie, Sleep, was this thing, and it hadn't been done. And uh, 
so it was notorious before it, it came out. Came out, and why why he didn't know how to make a movie is that he just bought a a Bolex camera, Bolex, and so we spent two weeks in July filming Sleep, and and uh, and then after the end of the the first week, maybe he sent them to be developed, and then it was the end of the second week, so we had two weeks, and then he gets it back. So it's a Bolex camera, which in those years, it's a two-minute two reel, and every 20 seconds you have to wind it. So that's what he did for two weeks. He re-rounded every 20 seconds, and then when he gets it developed, every 20 seconds there's a jerk in the in the film, because when you do this, the camera's on a stand, you know. Well, he must be so there's two, and he has hundreds and hundreds of films that he took, and it's all nothing. Then he, we, he meets a friend of ours, somebody called Bud Worth Shafter, who was a filmmaker. And Bud says, Andy, there's a gadget. You plug in the camera and you plug it in the wall and it rewinds automatically. <laughs> <laughs> so Andy gets this gadget and we shoot it for two more weeks. And this is now in August. And, uh, and then he gets that back and everything is perfect, you know. But you can't put two things, two, two minutes together. It's a jerk or a splice. And it was obviously that it doesn't work this way. And also, it's obvious that he didn't quite, he's not a filmmaker, so that he was shooting lots of different angles, so the many roles from this angle and these few angles that I eventually got into the movie, and it doesn't work. There's no way, I mean, he, he, not, you know, he wasn't a film editor and he didn't know how to do it. And so it's all now, now it's weekly in the Village Voice, you know, this newspaper, the Village Voice, mm, the, yeah. the, the progress of this film. And I think quite early, like at the end of August, there was some great stills, were all easy, you know, that, that famous one. So that's in the Village Voice already, and East Village, you know, it's go, and as it did continue going on. And so, but, but he, he worked on it deadly, and it was, it was this huge problem of not knowing what to do. <laughs> And and then and then I think the, 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 so the, the, this this I learned from a sort of an art cr critical Brandon Josephs who had who uh, we there was a giant screening in the Tate in London of, of Sleep for twenty four hours for, uh, Eric Satie's Vexations played live and they played Sleep for that thirty four hours. So no, in, like in, in Tate's turbine, turbine hall. And and so I so I I know I was there. I performed at the opening and at the end. I was a part, of, and I've been watching. So just Brandon says to me, John, I've seen this movie a thousand times, and there's I I found some. There's a sequence. There's a re, they repeat the, the re repetitions in sleep in the six and a half hours, like it's this gets repeated three times, and the other gets repeated, and they alternate in a funny way, and 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 what I remembered was really curious. So Andy and I, in September of 1963, at went to a, a John Cage produced Vexations, which is this 34 hour piece of uh, Eric Satie for the first time. He, even though it was written in the 1880s or 90s, it had never been performed in its entirety. So John Cage uh, rented the space. And, and what it is, it's 12 pianists alternating this repetition, repetitive uh, phrasing for a certain amount of time. It always it lasts between 32 and 34 hours. And so I was there and, and with Andy, and I stayed for a little while, a couple of hours, and then I left, and Andy was there, and then stayed, and then left, and came back at one o'clock in the morning, and, and stayed until, I don't know what, the, just this repetitive music, uh, live. And so then, uh, then I remember, I have this really great memory, so I remember that night, and in the program, because I know the theater up on uh, Third Avenue, this was a booklet, you know, on the cover was, uh, you know, in those days it was mimeograph, this old fashioned way of, no Xerox, a mimeograph. And it was a cover of Satie, a picture of Satie on the cover, an explanation of the process of vexations, and something else, and, and the, of course all the twelve pianists. And then at the back of it, it was a brief description of Eric Satie being a Rosicrucian, Rosicrucian, that spiritual whatever it is. And then they said one of the things that Rosicrucian do are these formulas, magical formulas, and they listed them. It was A B. But, you know, something like A, B, C, then B, C, B, C, A, B, you know, that kind of thing. And they listed three of these formulas. Because I remember I took a program home, and then I remember, you know how you remember things by just, and, and so I said to, so with the, the scheme of repetitions in, one, in Andy's sleep is one of these formulas. You know, however it goes, A, B, C, B, C, A, B, you know, whatever it is. And so I think I, what it, Andy, he didn't, he was not a Rosicrucian, but I think out of desperation, he knew he had to repeat things. 
And and he used maybe that. Those we'll, we'll never know because he, he didn't. But he sure he had the program home. Because what happened then? He shot some more sleep in early October. I don't know, like the first week or tenth of October. And he said he knew. He, he, you know, he was obviously clear what shots work well. And he said, I know what I want to do, but I want to do them over again. Some of them better. And that's when he came, we did, did another shoot in October, which were the final things. And I think some of those are the ones that really became the repetitions in sleep that he uh, cut. So that's the story. <coughs> yes? How would you describe Andy as a person and as an artist? Well, of course, he's a great artist. And, and, uh, and, one, and, and he was a really kind and shy and all those things that you don't, it's, and super sensitive, and, and, you know, withdrawn, and all those things that, but kind and shy was, yes? Do you think he was lonely? Uh, it's, his kind of loneliness was beyond loneliness. I, I have a funny thought about Andy, because in those years, that I, when I first met him in 62, or even before I met him, everybody hated pop art. Yeah. I mean, but everybody, including Bob Rauschenberg and Jasper Jolly, I mean, they, because at that point, even early on, they were calling, Andy was the father of Papa, so they became literally the grandfathers. You, you can imagine Bob Rauschenberg, the grandfather of Papa. He, he blew his top when those things happened. And Andy was, you know, that just because he transformed art, the art transformed art in a profound way that he wasn't even aware of at the time. And so he was hated all his life, always, and then when you get into, the the seventies. He's even more after he shot, and he and he his art really, in my mind, profoundly changes because when he got shot, he couldn't take drugs anymore. I mean, you know, and Andy's drug of choice was speed, and he took mm. speed, and and it's the result. You know, speed can be great. It works sometimes in your life. Jack worked for Jack Kerouac and all. You know, mm. these people. And so when he got shot, he couldn't take any more drugs, and somehow he didn't. One thing that speed does that's good, it makes you fearless. So a lot of those breakthroughs of Andy, it's like we were all on speed. So I mean, one saw that, and, like, and then when he was shot, he couldn't take another. They said one more pill, and you're dead. Mm. And he was afraid of dying, so he stopped all drugs. And I think his work changed. So he was still the brilliant artist, and goes on. But his decisions were less breakthroughs in some mm. way than than, a, than a, a, another turn in the work kind of work. What is your drug of choice? Well, I used to like speed then. Now I just smoke grass. I'm a writer, so smoking grass every day is a work drug because it's it's a drug of choice for writers. So, and uh, but that's all. Do they drink? Huh? Do you drink alcohol? And, and not so much. Yeah, I mm. drink, but not as much as I used to. But you prefer <laughs> grass. Huh? But you prefer it's grass. Writer, uh, grass is a writer's drug. You know, if you, oh, like grass yeah. is not a painter's drug nor a sculptor's drug. They like to smoke at night after they're mm. finished working, and it's obviously not a video. Because if you do smoke grass, you make the mistakes and things. But for a writer, it's sort of a writer's drug. Well, it's an interesting idea, since I, I always thought that alcohol is quite good for writing. Oh, that too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it depends if you're Charles Bukowski or uh, Or if or you're a poet. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you're a poet, then maybe mm -hmm. smoking pot is a okay idea. But I think drugs were so important. You know, all of that generated, all of, you know, like mm -hmm. when they said, when you know, on, Kerouac's on the road and he, and he wrote for 32 hours. Nobody writes for 32 hours unless you're on a drug. And and yeah. so, and Andy too, and there's countless other people. You know, William was junk. I mean, different people have their other drugs of choice. But, uh, but you know, in, in art school, you know, art school where they university or master programs, they never say. Go home and take some speed and see what it does for your work. Or, and you know, and this, all these drugs created a world. It's not one person. It's decades of people taking drugs transformed this world in art and literature. And so they, in these master programs, they never recommend that. What do you think <laughs> is the drug of today? I, I think I've been to America quite many times, and I personally think that it's pot. It's what? It's pot. Uh, America's drug of choice. It's like ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Everybody's doing it. Yeah. I think this is like the drug of today, more or less. Oh. Or, or, do you agree? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
I personally don't like it, but my I don't like taste. drugs. I've, I've, but I think drugs are. I mean, besides those drugs, it, 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 you remember like in the '60s to take LSD when when it was just first mm. into your mind was. Can you imagine from coming from ordinary middle class bourgeois families? Yeah, everyone was just transformed in a way that they saw for something very clearly. So mm. then it's gone on from then to now. But the, all those kind of drugs have had an incredible effect. What do you think about pop art? Uh, well, it's one of those um, miraculous moments in art history that where the world really changes inexplicably. There was, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't particularly, but any one of them doing it, or Andy's sort of the most prominent. But, uh, but it, the, the way it transformed art, it was uh, the culture kept catching up. Yeah, the I, culture I, I, painting finally catching up to post. Mo mo I mean, modern, modern, whatever. Mo you know, it is catching up to the moment. You know. Uh, yeah. Why are you following today's art? What do you think? Is it do you think art is important as such in today's world, or is it, was it or has it lo lost its position? No, it's sort of a, it's, the art world just endlessly transforms itself from one decade to another, and now, now it's you know it's just as fabulous to me now as it was then. Mm -hmm. Completely different, you know. And, and all, all of, it, and I, I have, it's, I have no reason to dislike anyone. But all that thing of so many artists, and then the, the ones who are the superstars and the pricings, the, the Jeff Koons, all of that phenomena, is just sort of amazing. And then sort of these, the Chinese and the, and the Arabs come in, and then they be, it becomes just so bizarre that, that it's like it never was before in some equally fantastic way as it was in the sixties. But completely, so I'm amazed by all this. I'm sort of a little bit in it because I have, you know, gallery, you know, these paintings I do all the time. Mm. And oh the, yeah, the those are so your paintings. Yeah, those are these are all from the, the '80s. This is '86, mm. and that's shortly mm. after. And uh, so I have shows all the time, and I, oh. I sort of like that. I mean, I, you know, it sort of functions to me as an extension of poet. You know, I'm a poet, so I perform and have these different lines. Performing as a poet is something that is, is an art form in itself, and making these paintings is an art form in itself because it requires different skills. And then but all, you still use a lot of text. Yeah, but it's by text. It all arises out of my words. So it's me doing it as a poet, not deciding to be an abstract painter and doing something else about it. But it's just working with different media. And then, needless to say, performing is a skill in itself besides video and, and all those other things. So. Have you tried also other mediums like video, like video and? Yeah, I, you know, and doing everything with technology, endlessly working for. You know, that was one of the things I did in the sixties and seventies. Is worth with the uh, making electronic compositions on the Moog synthesizer. Oh. And Bob Moog was a Bob Moog, the Moog synthesizer. was a friend of mine, so I sort of went and worked with him. You know. Do you do it on your own, or do you hire somebody who is skilled? For like electronic. Oh no! I have these great engineers. I have one great engineer who I've been working with since 1970. Bob Moog was before 1970. That I work all the time with now. He's a genius. He's an engineer. He's the one who sort of created Laurie. You know Laurie Anderson. All those yeah. fancy, those great things that she does. The window that slides. That's all Bobby's. He's the engineer who she has an idea and then he makes it. But to make these things, is, <laughs> that's so we work all the time. One of the things we're doing now, we've done it, it, it was several versions, but there was one just opened in Norway, dial a poem. You know, I have, you know, dial a poem used to be on the telephone, you randomly got all these poems, so, you know, so we made a new thing where the computer is in the top, is in this little telephone, and you pick it up and you like dial it, and you like iPhone or something. Yeah, well, no, this is sort of an old fashioned, an old sort of hard, hard line phone, oh. one of those. And, and there's a computer, this, this looks like a phone, in, but there's 200 poems by 80 poets and you randomly get the same thing and you don't have to call outside even. It's, this is, a, not, so it's a work of art, one of the, you know, but it's Bobby invented that <laughs> for me. How much do you are oh, still in touch with people from like the 60s, like four uh, circles, do you, do you meet Bridget Berlin occasionally, for example? No, I, I, so occasionally I can't even say. I saw her once in a long, a long kind of a few years ago, but no, she's, she doesn't. Uh, I see a lot of people in the, like the, uh, in the Andy Warhol Museum and the Andy Warhol Foundation. Mm -hmm. All of the people who work there are sort of friends of mine. So I run into them all, the, or like now I go tomorrow to Pittsburgh, to the Andy mm -hmm. Warhol Museum, and do something tomorrow night about 13 most wanted men at the museum. And so, so I see that world. But everyone else vanished, you know? 
I think sick or old, you know, Viva, <laughs> Viva, who was so bright and brilliant, just sort of vanished into California and likes to play golf. And, and, <laughs> Jesus. And, and so each of them when, are not around, each of the, whoever is still alive are not around. I really wanted to interview uh, Bridget Burley and I wrote her an email. I got her contact from um, Andy Warhol Museum, um, but she never wrote me back. It was like t three days ago when I sent the email. Yeah. No, she generally says no. I mean, I, I, you know, she's quite sort of separate. She doesn't do that, so I, she probably said. But I don't know. Is she like a hermit? Well, s sort of. You know, oh. she's very, uh, she's very grand too. You know, she lives uptown on the Upper East Side and has upper a East great, Side, great okay. life. I think they made, they made a documentary about her, like titled "Pie in the Sky." Uh, I've, oh, I've read, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I haven't seen it. So the other interesting thing about me and Andy now is just happening now, for, for instance, is that I have a, uh, and the reason I know about it is I have a giant me. I have a, I have a giant show in Pal Palais Tokyo next year in, in October of 2015, and it's a show. The whole museum. It's called I Love John Jono by Ugo Rondononi, who's created the show, my life's work of all of these things, and, and in one of the, it's in ten galleries. And one of the galleries is the Andy Warhol Gallery, and that has, for, for years, this has been planned for years, so it would naturally have sleep projected, and uh, so the two screen tests and the, the you know the plex the big plexiglass sleep and and the, and the, the photo booth things and all all those things different things, but something happened beginning last April. Uh, this uh, Bruce Jenkins, who's the uh, film resume guy. Discovered, they discovered all this other footage of me. One, one of it is, now it's been released, me washing dishes naked, this 20 <laughs> minutes thing. And then, then there's a, me sl now this is the new footage, they discovered lots of new footage of, like this is me, me sleeping in a hangar, a, a hangar, a hammock, hammock. And when, one didn't know any of this, this is the sketch for sleep, but Andy, Andy Trace, you know, anyway, all, uh, this and, and a whole bunch of other films. And then I just learned a, a couple of days ago there were even some more with me and Naomi up, take, on the top floor of this building. So all of this is being, half has been transferred into digital uh, and the other half they're doing right now. And it'll all be shown in the, uh, that Andy Warhol Museum the Andy, in Pali, Tokyo in, in, his, in that gallery. But I was flabbergasted because it's, uh, I, 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 once I see the footage I remember it. But the, the, and it was, the, he just had sort of a little camera and was just shooting, you know, like from his hip, hip, uh, so to speak. But I, there's something I, I just remember I didn't finish talking about, is that when I said that Andy was always rejected, it went on his entire life, you know, how he was, and the more he became famous and before he took that route of the endless celebrity portraits and Henry Kitchener and living that other world, so he was hated I mean, obviously, people, the, the pop artists, they liked each other you know, here, but everyone else in the art world, from the abstract painters through Bob and Jasper and, and the serious art world, hated Andy at the beginning. And then in the 70s and 80s, until he died, he was hated more by them because of, he became so famous and rich. And, and, and then, when, then when he died, and, and Kenneth McShine did his show at, uh, at MoMA, was the curator of his show at MoMA, and he was a good friend of mine, and I had dinner with him while he was curating it after Andy died. And, and, and he said, it's so difficult, because the, well, so he, he said, John, do you realize Andy was more hated at, his, at the moment of when he died than at any other time in his life? <laughs> and I was shocked. And he said, not only that, then when we were talking about it, that they even had problems at MoMA raising money. Because, you know, even though he didn't take drugs and he was gay, but he didn't do anything, he was considered a drug druggy and a gay, you know. Or, what do you mean by did not do anything? Well, I mean, he didn't have promiscuous sex or he didn't do anything. He was just gay and he didn't take drugs for then 25 years. But they couldn't raise money because of the drugs and being gay. This is in, mm. in the, whenever that was, 1988, when they were raising mm. money, 788. And then it occurred to me, that at the moment of death, <laughs> Vandy Warhol's life flashes in from him. It's like those 1,000 times of rejection from the 1950s when the mm -hmm. abstract painters thought he was a gay man and didn't, you know, de Kooning and all, didn't, all through his life till he died. So it's just, even though he was so famous and so successful and rich and loved by everyone, he was hated by everyone. And, you, and I have a similar problem with, you know, people in the. <laughs> 
people in conservative areas of our world, art and literature and whatever, you know, they haven't. But Andy was it was extreme in his life that he was so famous and so hated. I can't help always think that that was the saddest part of Andy's life because that's like having cancer. It's this thing that gnaws at you because you're famous, but somehow the one thing you want, you get always slapped in the face because it's always people who dislike you. It's always criticism, endless criticism arising of treating you badly and all of that. And that, that's, I think, something that nobody ever thinks about with Andy because they just think he's this, you know, a dumb idea that he's this robot or, or that he's so famous that those things don't matter. But I think that really mattered to him. Yes.